Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lonto Montindi, and today we're going to talk about uh, visual tracking. Uh, we're going to cover some uh, general tracking framework, uh, background subtraction, and TLT, or whatever it is, estimation or the common filter. So basically, uh, we're going to have to ask ourselves, uh, first of all, I think we have to define the problem. Have to say uh, what is tracking? Tracking is estimating the trajectory of an object as it moves around the space. So uh, basically, uh, like this guy here, uh, if we have a static scene, we're going to be uh, tracking either a single object or multiple targets. Uh, mostly, we're going to be doing uh, uh, stationary camera and uh, uh, rigid, rigid or flux. Uh, we have three subtasks. I mean, a tracker can also provide uh, object specific information such as orientation, area, shape of an object. Uh, but first, we have to build a model and then uh, use what you know, what you know, to find where the object was in the frame. And then we're going to make predictions about where the object is going and then update the model just iteratively. We're going to look at all this stuff a bit later. Uh, Code. So, the first that we have to differentiate between detection and tracking. So, detection is identifying moving objects. Uh, or object is a predefined property, while tracking is estimating the property. So, tracking has like, uh, I don't have any good pictures. But, tracking is like uh, uh, drawing a line as to where the object is moving. Uh, across the uh, image, across the uh, video. So, but we're going to look at other examples still. Uh, we have seen correlation based template matching, uh, features based tracker, and active controls of light video sequence. Uh, we're going to do some more of those. Uh, it has, uh, uh, tracking has a lot of applications. Uh, we can do motion based recognition, uh, image guided surgery. And track where uh, instruments are moving as well, uh, automated surveillance, uh, video indexing. Uh, I wish I had some good videos. Automated uh, human computer interaction, traffic monitoring, and data navigation. Uh, in all this, you identify objects, and as they move across, you kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, give them numbers, give them identifiers, and uh, track them as they move across. Here we have some applications. Video is not working. So here we see uh, this is a contour of the hand is being tracked, uh, as unlike all the other features. So uh, in this video, we see uh, all the other sections are being ignored, uh, and only this, uh, as the video keeps looping, the uh, algorithm is able to update and uh, stay with the target object. Another one here in microscopy. So uh, we have like, I guess these are uh, microorganisms, a petri dish or something. And as Actually, you this is neuron. Say what? This is neuron. Neuron? Yeah, it's filmed neuron. So they take growing neuron. Okay. They grow a neuron in a dish. And then they take in pictures of that neuron once in a while, like once in a few hours. They take in that picture and then they start in all those pictures and making video of it. Okay. Like how neuron grows in time. How they can actually grow separately neuron in time. And then you need to track, like you have some small white blobs, which are those nodules, those parts of the neuron which are growing. Okay. And then you want to track that part. Because they are moving a little bit, the image is moving a little bit, and you know, it's not the same location all the time. So it's alive, so it's moving a little bit. Now, you want to track with the numbers, so it's very hard to see on, on your computer for some reason, uh, with that resolution, maybe. But the idea is that number should be attached to each white tiny blob, and you should track it through the video. So you have multi-target tracking. When you have like hundreds of targets, 
and you want to track them all to assign some number to each one of them to see the trajectory of each one of them. Past video has been interesting because it moved, it tracks these guys as they are walking around the place. It's not for some reason it's not playing. It was working a second ago. I'm clicking on this. Maybe just go out of the presentation mode and show them a little more. Just click on no, no. Click on the same and play button. Okay. Yes, that is one. It takes time to, to say. You can go on with the uh, presentation and we can get back to that later. So, uh, you see, why is tracking challenging? Uh, tracking is not that easy because of the uh, first reason is we're trying to represent 3D objects on a, on a 2D image. So, we lose a lot of information uh, just basically because. Uh, one dimension is lost. Uh, noise and clutter in images. Uh, basically, when you're trying to detect an object uh, using traditional methods, uh, all that noise can really um, affect your detection schemes. Uh, complex objects and shapes in motion. Uh, basically, uh, if an object is moving in an unpredictable way, uh, all our algorithms fail. Uh, non rigid or articulated nature of objects, uh, some objects can form or, or whatever, uh, if they do not have a good solid behavior or sort of characteristics, uh, partial or full object occlusions, uh, that's where you can see an object at one point in time and it gets hidden behind either another object or just goes out of the scene. Uh, scene illumination changes, uh, you can imagine that uh, if, say, you, are, you have a camera outside and it gets to night time, you can throw off your algorithm and may not be able to sort of, uh, track anymore because the lighting changes, uh, and then real-time processing requirements. Uh, all these things are process intensive, and uh, so it makes that hard. Uh, anyway, so to kind of uh, manage all that complexity to give us a chance to actually solve this problem, we constrain a few uh, variables. Uh, so we assume that the object motion is smooth, there's no abrupt uh, changes. That means just that the object cannot be flying on one side and then just uh, switch off and appear somewhere else. Uh, object motion is assumed to be a constant velocity or even constant acceleration. But uh, then prior knowledge of the number of sides of objects, of object appearance and shape, uh, we can add this information and it will make uh, all that tracking easier. Uh, and so this is the uh, general framework. So we have a video sequence, we do some pre-processing, do some segmentation, some prediction and measurement, but this is your slide, I, I didn't quite get it completely. Would you like to explain on that? I can explain on that too. Huh? If you want, I can explain on that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, Basically, there is a step which is called prediction, and this is coming before the measurement of actual new frame. So, let's say we do tracking in the video sequence, and you have frames coming in, and you want to track some specific object in those frames which are coming in. Now, having all the frames, you found the most probable location of your specific object, right? So, you have some coordinates of that object. Now, given all of the previous trajectories that you measured from previous frames, and only present frame, can you predict what, where this object should be in the next frame without having that frame yet, like ahead of time? Which means if you have like 30 frames per second, so can you predict it 1/30th before it happens, where it will be? So it will not fly away, too far away, right? So it should be somewhere close, but where it will go? Can you guess? 
So for that you have all kind of techniques. One technique, it will stay close enough, so just search in the region around, right? This is your search region definition. You can say, well, if it was moving kind of by a linear line like that, it will continue moving the same way and then it will be kind of in the next point. If it had uh, previously continuous like constant velocity, more or less, like plus minus, that will keep the same constant velocity from the previous frame and it will jump the same distance as it jumped in the previous distance in the same direction, right? Good enough linear approximation. If it was accelerating all the time with the same acceleration, then it will be jumping larger distance proportionally to the previous piece of acceleration, right? So the, the, the intervals will be growing. This is called prediction. And for that you have multiple, more sophisticated, so those types of predictions that I just told you are too primitive. So those are very simplistic ones and simple ones. You have more complicated ones which are based on filters. Those filters are Kalman filter, particle filter, PDF, PhD, you have tons of different filters which are capable as part of their steps to do some specific prediction by some sort of smoothness. So they assume the smoothness of the curve, of the trajectory, and based on that smoothness they try to predict where it will be before you get the measurement, before you get the next frame. And then it will be much easier to search around that predicted point. You guess where it is. Prediction is basically guess. You guess where it is, and then you're saying, let's look around the place and find a little bit fine tuning of around the place. Right? This is prediction. Um, but first, we have to represent the object in some way. So, uh, I guess one of the steps that we take in uh, visual tracking is uh, object representation. If you remember the um, neural network uh, video, we had nice little squares, so this is what this stuff is. So an object is anything that is of other interest. Objects can be represented by their shapes and appearance. So the first uh, way we can represent it is using points, just a simple point to track the uh, location of the object. Uh, some are primitive geometric shapes, like squares. I think that was what was used for the uh, neural network, just a square or a rectangle or an ellipse. Represent the object uh, good for uh, when the objects are rigid. Uh, the, the points, uh, this scheme is good for you know when the object is so tiny or it's so far away that you, know, you can't really put a square around it and you know, construct the object. Uh, we also have object silhouette and contours. Uh, it's good for tracking complex numbers and shapes, uh, articulated shape models, and skeletons. Uh, this figure will summarize it really well. Uh, so this is like a point tracker, and uh, this is the, so here this is the multiple points tracker, and this is the squares, and um, what is this? Feet, it's part lace multiple patches, and the skeletal model, and some silhouettes. Uh, next we have our object appearance. Uh, where we represent the appearance of our uh, features. We have probability densities, which are like Gaussian uh, templates, uh, which are formed using uh, geometric shapes or silhouettes. Uh, we have uh, active appearance models. We have templates suitable for objects to be closest to not very considerably uh, during tracking. Uh, and these are just formed using uh, simple geometric shapes. Uh, active appearance models are generated simultaneously uh, modeling the object shape. Uh, uh, so basically active appearance model is uh, where you have specific landmarks in whatever object you, you're tracking and uh, for each landmark an appearance vector is stored which is in the form of a color or a texture and uh, multi-view appearance models this is where you kind of uh, you represent an object as if it's, uh, it can turn or it has multiple views, not just looking straight at it. Uh, and so that's uh, active. Okay. And then we have to, the 
next thing we have to do is select uh, features for tracking. Uh, the most desirable property of visual feature is its uniqueness, I mean, uh, or how well it's defined against the background. And this could be the color, the edges, the optical flow, and the texture. Object detection categories. So this is these are the um, uh, object detection like the types that we have. We ha had a very good paper that kind of categorizes them. So we have point detectors, <laughs> uh, segmentation, uh, background modeling, uh, and supervised classifiers. Mm. All, all this, uh, all all these are just uh, ways we can uh, detect objects. Uh, for example. Uh, we're going to be dealing with higher projector. I think that's why I highlighted it. So, uh, for example, here we have uh, manual selection in fast frame. Uh, manual selection is, uh, I think, uh, where we subtract. Uh, no, just when you select it by hand. We select it by hand, and you in just fast frame. Outlining the object you want to track. Because uh, how do you know what you want to track? Let's say you have a crowd of people walking by. What do you want to track? You just by hand selecting it by two points, like bounding box or uh, just contour around. Selecting by hand. And the next one is uh, background subtraction, uh, background elimination. So I think this is where, uh, within a period of time, the background tends to stay the same. And whatever is in the foreground, if you're able to subtract it, that's the, uh, the whatever you want to track. So if you have like a camera in a traffic section, uh, after a while you'll be able to notice that the road is constant, vehicles moving, or uh, and that's how you can be able to tell, detect what you want to uh, track. So technically, the second one's assumption is that everything which moves is your target. Okay, everything which is moving you want to track. Yeah, could you explain this equation for us? Yeah, so uh, you have two types of background subtraction uh, or elimination. Uh, the first one is basically pay attention to what it does. You have image i with coordinates i and j. So those are special co uh, coordinates x and y basically, or i and j in that case. And you have coordinate of time, which is basically number of frames. So in total you have i of i, j, and t, right? So it's like coordinate of the point and time. Now, how do you know that some point is background and not your object? You say that this is something which is not moving this time, which means the next one will be very, very similar, like next one in time, like t plus one, it will be very similar pixel to what you have right now which means the difference or absolute difference between them should be very small. This means background, technically speaking. This is exactly what the first equation says. If the dis difference between i at i, j, t and i, j, t minus 1, which is basically consecutive frames, right? If the difference larger than some threshold, okay, then leave it as is, which means this is obvious. If this is smaller or equal than some predefined threshold, which is some small number, yeah. then this is background, put it zero. Just kill all of the background, which is lower than the threshold. Like if the change between the consecutive pixel, like next frame pixel, and present or previous frame pixel in that case, and present pixel is very small, just put zero there. Just don't use a pixel. Whatever left is your target, or multiple targets, whatever. So this is first approach. Second approach will be different. Second approach says, look, this is not very reliable, right? You have noise, you have tons of different problems with images, and some pixels will just pop up to be bright or dark randomly as part of the object, and object colors might change in time, and so on and so on. So you have a million different problems with that approach. Not very reliable, not robust. More than that, let's say your object is moving like that, okay, that way. So this is your previous frame, and this is your next frame, right? So what is the difference between those two frames? Let's say the object is white and background is black. Very simple, okay? So the difference between those two images 
is that one white, that one white, and that one black in the middle. Mm -hmm. So you get two white bars and black in the middle. Mm -hmm. This is not what you want, right? You want all of that thing to be white and that part to be black. Originally, right? You, you want mm -hmm. what is the object right now in, in present frame, not what is the difference between the object now and mm -hmm. in previous frame, yeah. right? But this is exactly what you get when object moves, right? You, you have yeah. like common part disappears and you get like what is the difference in the future frame mm -hmm. and what is the difference in the previous frame since you're taking absolute difference. So, what people invented is different kind of background subtraction. They say what is average? This is the background. Okay, so now I will compare not to the next frame, to previous frame, but I will compare, I will take like a bunch of frames, I will average on all of them, and on average I will not see any motion, right? Because I'm averaging, say, on 50 frames, on the second or two seconds of video. Okay, so I will average on all of those previous frames, and I will compare i of ijt to the average. If it is different from average, like over time, then this is object. If this is very similar to background, which is average over time, then this is background, and then I will put zero there. So this idea works much better, but what is the problem with the approach? First of all, you need to store all of the previous n frames, whatever it is to, to compute average, naturally, right? So you, you need more memory. And it's more computationally expensive because you, you're doing that for every frame. You're averaging for every frame. So this is more computationally expensive. It still works in real time. Not a big deal for modern computers. But compared to the first one, which is almost primitive and can fly and not taking any time, it's just difference between two frames, takes no time. Second one is more computationally expensive. Yeah. So in the for example, in the second one, you couldn't have a moving camera, right? In both you can have any moving camera. Okay. It's like both of them assuming stationary camera. And targets are moving mm -hmm. in the same. Okay. Yes. So which one is more accurate? Is it average so or the second one more accurate? Mm -hmm. The first will be larger for the second one. The first one. Mm -hmm. Not always. Um, it depends on the on the background. It depends on the notice. What if there's change in light in the video between the first frame and the last one. So you're assuming that light is not changing that fast because you're averaging on the last mm -hmm. second or two, right? Yeah. So if you suddenly turn off the entire light, yeah. you see all of the picture Black. white. Oh. It's all target. It was change everywhere. If your camera moves, you see everything white. Because camera moves. Yeah, so this is disadvantage mm -hmm. of the approach. All these use uh, different techniques. I think uh, that's the most uh, deterministic methods, uh, uh, like the centroid tracker. Uh, you have to assume you have a bright target on the dark background, and you're able to track its position. Uh, that's just I think the, uh, this is the average location. So centroid tracker position of the target is x and y is that, uh, where m. So this is a question of centroid, which is coming from physics. So if you learn physics, how to find center of mass, this is exactly how you do that. So basically you have binary image right now. Like you have target, which is just binary block of some shape somewhere in the image. Now, you assume that you have only one of them in the image. Like you're tracking single target and this is like somewhere you have some white block, right? Now, how you find centroid? You're basically tracking it from left to right, scanning, scanning one by one, and now you're multiplying by how far is that 
from the beginning of the image, which is just I, right? So I running and G running from one to size of the image, okay, in X direction and Y direction. And then you multiply I by value of the binary image, which is value M at point IG. And then you divide it by total weight. So technically speaking, you're thinking about white points as weight one and zero points as weight zero, right? And then you find the centroid of that total weight, like center of mass for the total weight. So if the blob will be bigger around that point or smaller around that point, nothing will change. Okay, if you grow it, scale it around that point, it will not change because the centroid will stay at the same point. It's a stable point, right? But if you will shift the entire shape, moving to some direction, centroid will move exactly the same distance in that direction, if you translate in that image. And then, this is very convenient for tracking because in most cases, you don't want to check specifically the entire shape of the object. You just care where it is. Like you want to assign single point to object. And this is one of the most robust points for the object because this point is not changing much no matter what. You can change a little bit boundaries, you can change pixels here and there around, you can add noise, you can, doesn't matter. Centroid will stay almost at the same point. It's like median in statistics, it's like middle point. So this middle point will be, you can think about that uh, intuitively as axis point, like if you putting some axis through that shape and you're rotating that thing, it's rotating like a wheel, right? It's not like doing all kind of jumps when it rotates. It rotates completely normally around. Okay, this is a centroid point, center of mass. So you can turn it around that point so it's somewhere in the middle of the object. Good for uh, smaller public targets, from 10 pixels wide. Uh, uh, works for larger targets with uniform intensity. Uh, robust only in uh, low class scenarios. Uh, but the uh, main thing that we're going to be dealing with is the KLP tracker. After the, I think it's Lucas, Kanade, and Tomasi. Those are the people who uh, came up with it, and uh, it, it's a more efficient method. Than searching over a larger window. Uh, that is, if we have a good estimate of object position already, we, we can efficiently refine it using these equations. Uh, our assumption is that the estimate, our estimate of position, must be very close to where the object actually is. Um, so we're going to look at it uh, next. And here is a, is a simple algorithm that uh, it's a simplified model version of the algorithm where you have uh, an object that's moving uh, down the screen from the center down to the left and uh, when the frames are laid on top of each other this is what it looks like and so if you are able to detect this corner uh, you could simply uh, uh, draw a line um, locate this corner on each and every frame and just draw a line uh, down in the direction in which the object is moving, so as I showed here. And, and this will just be a simple tracker, uh, tracking a simple box moving down across the screen. Uh, however, real life scenarios are, are more complex than that. For example, this uh, rectangle could be turning around, uh, it could have, uh, it could be going in and out of view in some, uh, in some cases. So this is the algorithm we're looking at now. We detect the highest corner in the first frame. Uh, for each highest corner, we compute the motion translation between consecutive frames to link uh, motion vectors to successive frames. Uh, and then we do it over again. We introduce new highest points by applying the highest vector every uh, 10 to 15 frames. Uh, but uh, like I said, it's 
that may not work in most cases because uh, we have uh, basic set of 2D transformations which uh, the object may undergo. Uh, maybe uh, this is simple translation, this way it's moving, which uh, algorithm may work. Uh, in this case, uh, I think this one is where it's uh, kind of Euclidean, is where it's turning a bit. Uh, this is uh, scaling down, and this is projected. I think it's turning towards uh, uh, one side is turning towards the, uh, the viewer. And so, somewhere it's kind of next. Here we have a uh, translation preserved orientation in the Euclidean uh, model uh, preserved for length, but it kind of uh, twists around. Um, and similarity uh, preserves the angles, but it kind of uh, shrinks the uh, thing down, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, so this previous algorithm, uh, whatever we have here, uh, may fail touch cases and so what, what we do uh, is that uh, in, the, in the previous step we calculated the Jacobians of uh, this transformation the uh, translation rigid uh, similarity affine projective and th these are basically the results uh, right here uh, we're going to use this Jacobian in our next calculation mm -hmm. Do you use all of that uh, just for one transformation, like one after another one, or you just choose one uh, transformation and apply it? Do you use all the transformation, or you just use one of them? Uh, we, we have to pick one. Okay. Uh, but we'll look at the algorithm a little Based on later. our needs. Okay, based on our needs. We're going to look at it the next page. So. So technically, each next one includes the, all the previous ones. So it's also, this is basically a hierarch, hierarchy of different transforms. The simplest ones, uh, the advantage of simplest ones is easy to work with, easy mass, it's just, Constant. let's say, simple translation, right? You're just moving your image like that, or moving your object like translation, mm -hmm. not scaling it, not rotating it, and so on. So it depends on what type of video you have. In some videos, objects might be just translated, so you don't need anything more sophisticated. So use simpleness. Let's say in some other videos, some objects also rotating, right? So you cannot use any more just translation. You need to use something more sophisticated than that. Now, for that, you need some other transform. And now in third transform, maybe you're also scaling your object, right? In addition to translation and rotation and stuff like that. So you need more sophisticated transform. In some other stuff, you have also sharing, which is kind of squeezing the shape somehow. Uh, in other one, you have perspective transform, where you have depth, which is perspective, in, like in images, right? So, so the object goes into the depth and changing angle. So it depends on your needs in your video. Yeah. Um, and so this is the uh, mathematical formula for so what we want to find is the alignment of uh, the alignment uh, between uh, and, uh, basically our uh, I represents I represents our image and this represents the work and this represents the uh, template and so what we're trying to do is uh, minimize the uh, difference between the sum square difference between the uh, whatever was worked in the template and uh, the square that just removes the sign. So it says what transformation you is the closing in brackets there in the first one. Yeah, After the double. Uh, and so we apply what transformation of work can you apply to the image i so that we can minimize the sum of the square difference. So here, the next step is to assume an estimate for b. So this is the delta p uh, variable that we added. Uh, and this, we're trying to find the parameter p. And so uh, we use, uh, next we find this 
functions Taylor series, uh, which brings us down here. Uh, and so, um, uh, and we only take like the first, I think Taylor series is like a function of uh, sums of uh, mm -hmm. the derivatives. Higher derivatives. Yeah, so we only take the first one and uh, next. Here, uh, so how do we find the? Uh, like we're trying to find the minimum here, right? So when we have this equation, how do we find the place where it's the least, right? We differentiate it and then set it equal to zero, and we, we get the, uh, the curve, the lowest point. So it gets really uh, it goes everywhere. The equation goes everywhere, but that's basically what we're doing here. We uh, differentiate it. It comes up here, something, uh, and then uh, it's taken out. And then we all set this entire differential. We differentiate it with respect to delta p. Can you stop for a second, please? Yeah. Can anybody explain what this goal holds of computation? Is it the Where we are aiming, where we are going with that. Mm -hmm. what do you want, why we want it to be computed? What, what does that say? What does sigma x on i minus t? Like why we want that thing to be minimal? In other words, why we want to find such a p that this sigma will be minimal? What, what does it mean more sigma? So we get template, we move it around the picture, and we see the minimum difference between template and not exact that region. Close, but not exact. Mm -hmm. So it here, is. so what is i of w of x p? It should be close to these two parentheses. Here, yeah, so missing one here. So what is that i of w as a function of p. Pay attention, the p is a parameter, right? So it's actually a mm. list of parameters, not single. It's like an entire matrix of parameters. So this is, so what is i of w on the coordinates x, uh -huh. y? Uh, yeah. So i has coordinates like i, j, mm. or x, y, whatever, yeah, special coordinates. So what is i of w, x, y, with some parameters? This is basically image after application of some transformers of image. So it's rotated, scaled, translated <coughs> image. Now, how far you translate, rotate, and uh, how big is the scaling depends on P. So those are all possible transformations of the image based on the parameter set P, whatever it is. Okay? It might be just pure translation, but it might, might be all other possible transforms. Okay? So it basically modifies the image somehow, scaling it, moving it somewhere. Okay, so this is i of set c. Now, what is t? Template. Template. What kind of template? Where are you took the template from? If the else is going on track, or it could be the previous image, the projection so of the exactly previous image. Is. So this is you cut from the first frame where you selected it manually or by any other method. You selected the Rectangle, yeah. okay, cut it, okay, save it aside as a variable, right? This is your t, this is your template. Mm -hmm. Now you're trying to match the template With that. to your, because this template is clearly much smaller than the image, right? So you're holding the template at constant place, which is mm -hmm. zero, zero, mm -hmm. and then you're doing something like that with your image around, okay? With scaling, rotations, mm -hmm. things like that, and you're trying to find such a parameter p or set of parameters p. Right, which will give you what? It's the new orientation. So this is difference squared, yeah. which is Euclidean error squared, yeah. technically speaking, between all the pixels. Like you, you're doing difference pixel by pixel after the trans transformation, matching, trying to match to that one. In perfect match, this should be zero, right? Because it's kind of perfect match, yeah. but you'll never get perfect match. So we're looking basically for minimum 
instead of perfect match. The best match you could get is all those translations, rotations, and so on of the image that you get, like new, new slide, new image, new frame, right? Then you want to minimize that scene to find the best fit. Instead of that, you can use absolute value of that, but why don't you want to use absolute value and you're using that difference squared and not absolute values instead of squared? We meet in that over and over again. This is coming all over the place in computer vision. And not only computer vision, optimization and other areas. Why do you want to minimize something squared? A different squared, not just absolute difference, which makes more sense, right? But you want that difference mm -hmm. will be zero. Why different squared you want to be minimal? What pain uh, can you get from that? Does that have to do with the gradient? Because you have the derivative. Gradient and when you find the derivative for the gradient. Mm -hmm. the, so can you differentiate the absolute value? value? Yeah, so this is a reason, because mm -hmm. this thing you can't differentiate. Mm -hmm. This, this fun function is differentiable, and absolute value is not differentiable. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. Mm -hmm. You want differentiable function. Now, why why don't you want to take like force power? Too much. Too much, yeah, mm -hmm. you can say that. Too much. So um, you put it to zero to find the uh, key. I think uh, they defined it as the uh, what was it Hessian? Hessian inverse. Inverse. Mm -hmm. inverse. Inverse. And uh, so, uh, so so we find uh, the delta p is the uh, default uh, uh, expression here. And so the final algorithm comes to this is what we're going to talk uh, one step by step is uh, walk the image, uh, subtract uh, t from i, which is what we need here, uh, compute the gradient, and here, uh, evaluate the Jacobian of uh, d w of t, uh, compute the steepest descent, uh, and so on and so forth. Inverse, uh, compute the inverse Hessian, uh, multiply steepest descent with error. You have zero step missing, right? Zero step is p, because you cannot do p equals to p plus delta p without defining p first. So what is the initial set of the parameters p? You always start with just identity matrix, which is just don't move and don't change your image. Take it as easy. Somewhere where they have an updated, uh, a better uh, algorithm than this, but we didn't uh, explore that. And so after that, I think we're going to go to um, some kind of code. And uh, uh, this, this is what comes with uh, uh, what comes with loaded on. MATLAB, and uh, I think this algorithm uses uh, 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 to detect a space, it uses the uh, Viola Jones detection algorithm to detect the space, so in case you're curious, uh, and then uh, we map the points that define our image, first of all, and then uh, we, we now keep on tracking uh, that object that we have defined across each and every frame. Uh, run it. This is basically the guy. Uh, as you can see, as he moves across, uh, we indicate that the points here are the features that have been detected. And uh, this is the, uh, this is the square, whatever, square uh, object representation. 
this is a good example of uh, actual code tracking someone's face. Uh, for the life of me, I couldn't get it to work on anything else. Uh, when you have a, a video or just a random kind of video, it just works on this. I think it's because they have specific parameters, so uh, the face is too large. It throws off the algorithm, and uh, it's not able to do anything. So that is the basic uh, uh, algorithm it uses. That uses the Lucas Kalade algorithm, and uh, the next the traditional Lucas Kalade is typically done with a small column-like feature. In a larger window um, because it's being tracked. And so, uh, assumption of constant flow, pure translation for all pixels in a larger window. So, I think what that says is uh, we assume smooth motion uh, and we can uh, generalize Lucas Kanadi approach to other 2D uh, parametric transformations. Questions?